Depression is, unfortunately, one of the most common mental health disorders, with around 1 in 5 adults in the UK experiencing some form of depression. And this is even higher for women aged 16 to 29, with over 4 in 10 experiencing depressive symptoms. With that in mind, before I go any further, I do need to say this is a video designed for students of psychology to learn about the principles of depression. If you're here looking for support, you're very welcome to watch, as knowledge is power, but there might be other organizations with resources that are better designed to help you directly. I've placed some links in the description that I hope are helpful. So with that being said, in this video, I'm going to discuss the cognitive to approach to both explaining and treating depression. So of course, if you remember your cognitive concepts, I'm going to be talking about schemas. This is a fairly complex idea, and I will cover everything you need to know for the psychopathology unit here. But if you want a video of a little bit more depth on the basics of the cognitive approach, you might want to check out my video in the Approaches Unit first. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. The Cognitive Approach to Explaining Depression As this video takes a cognitive approach to explain depression, it won't surprise you that it's going to be suggesting that depression and behaviours associated with depression are due to problems of internal mental processes. So this means depressed people's thinking is disturbed, or put another way, their cognitions are in some way broken or maladaptive. You may remember, cognitive psychologists use a term called a schema. A schema is a mental framework built from experience, and we use them as a mental shortcut. They're a way of quickly understanding the world and objects in the world. This means it doesn't take too much mental energy to decide how to respond to a range of situations. We have schema for objects in the world and a simple example I used in the cognitive video was a schema for a chair. We have a set of expectations about what a chair looks like and what it can do. This means you don't need to make too much mental effort when interacting with chairs in your everyday life. You'll see a chair and automatically sit on it. Scale that up to having a schema for everything in your life, and that's how we navigate the world without excessive overthinking. But these schemas, these automatic assumptions, can lead to biases. And that's particularly problematic when these biases are negative and about ourselves and the events in our lives. Both of the following cognitive explanations in this video, Beck's negative triad and Ellis's ABC model, explain depression as due to faulty negative thinking, and also suggest the best way of treating depression is to challenge and change this negative bias. Aaron Beck argued that people who are depressed have three types of schema with an automatic negative bias. He called this the negative triad. These are negative beliefs people have about themselves, called self-schemas, such as feeling inadequate or unworthy. They may have negative schemas about the world, seeing it as hostile and threatening. And finally, they may have negative schemas about the future, assuming things will always turn out badly. These negative thought patterns can lead to negative behaviours, such as avoidance, withdrawal and inaction. For example, an individual with depression might avoid social situations because they believe they'll be rejected or ridiculed. They might also withdraw from activities they once enjoyed, such as hobbies or exercise, because they believe that they're incapable of doing well. Finally, they might be unable to make decisions or take action because they believe that nothing they'll do will make a difference. These negative schemas often develop in childhood, but they provide a framework for persistent biases in adulthood, leading us to perceive the world inaccurately. Beck calls these biases cognitive distortions. Overgeneralization. When an individual has one negative experience, and assumes this will always happen. So perhaps a student starts A-levels, fails the first class test in one A-level subject, and now assumes they'll always fail on every future test in every subject. Selective abstraction, focusing on one detail out of context. This involves a process of mental filtering, only focusing on the negative. Say someone puts up a post on social media and they get lots of positive feedback, Selective abstraction, also known as selective perception, is mentally filtering out all the positive comments and focusing on just that one negative comment. Albert Ellis used something he called the ABC model to explain how someone with depression responds to stress, adversity, and unpleasant events in a way that leads to unhealthy emotions. The A in the ABC model refers to the activating event. This happens to people with and without depression. So it could be something major like the end of a relationship, or as small as missing a bus. The difference between someone with and without depression is B, their belief. This could be rational or irrational. A rational belief at the end of a relationship might be, we weren't right for each other, we wanted different things, I should move on. 
And a rational belief may be, oh, I'm fundamentally unlovable. I'll never be able to find someone who will stay with me. C is a consequence. And you can see how it would be different for each person depending on if the belief is rational or irrational. For the relationship scenario, someone with a rational belief would likely look for a new healthy relationship, while the person with the irrational belief might either avoid relationships altogether or get into an unhealthy relationship, feeling they can't do any better. Ellis also uses an amusing sounding term that explains the source of irrational beliefs. This is masturbatory thinking. And it's a problem that comes from not accepting we don't live in a perfect world. A quote from Alice is, There are three musts that hold us back. I must do well, you must treat me well, and the world must be easy. You can see those beliefs result in a lot of pressure, and certainly we'll be disappointed when we fail to achieve an unrealistic goal, other people don't behave the way we want them to, or an unexpected event happens and ruins our plans. The cognitive approach to explaining depression, evaluations. There is research that supports the role of irrational thoughts in depression. Grizzoli and Terry recorded the thinking styles of 65 women before giving birth and again six weeks after the women gave birth. They found that the women with negative thinking styles were the most likely to develop depression, especially in women with infants who were identified as having difficult temperaments. This supports the idea that faulty thinking leads to depression, but the fact that the women with the difficult children are most at risk supports the idea that the diaphesis stress mechanism to Beck's theory. Negative thinking is a vulnerability which adverse of life experiences like motherhood can trigger. Now we have to be careful with this evaluation. If you're asked to outline and evaluate cognitive explanations for depression, that needs to be our focus, not treatment. But the cognitive theories that explain depression have indeed led to highly effective cognitive therapies. March showed CBT had an effective rate of 81% after 36 weeks of treatment, the same as drug therapy. So these treatments have been successful in helping people recover from depression, and the fact that they're successful suggests the underlying cognitive explanations are valid. However, cognitive explanations are not full explanations of depression. Many people with depression also experience anger, and people with bipolar depression experience manic phases, times when they feel extremely happy, overly excited, confident and focused. These features of some types of depression really can't be explained by theories like Beck's, that explain depression is due to negative schemas, as schemas are resistant to change. There is also significant evidence for a biological origin for depression. Family studies and genetic research suggest predisposition to depression is inherited, likely genes that influence the activity of neurochemicals like serotonin in the brain, and the effectiveness of drug treatments like SSRIs suggest there is a biological aspect to depression. Cognitive theories also depend on the assumption that the thoughts of someone with depression are irrational. It could be that their lives are objectively bad, and depression is a reasonable response. Some researchers think that the bias is with people without depression. They live their lives with rose-tinted glasses, selectively perceiving the world in a positive light, giving themselves overly positive self-evaluations, and have unrealistic optimism. The problem with people with depression, then, is they've lost this positive bias, the rose-tinted glasses, and unfortunately see the world how it really is. The cognitive approach to treating depression. As the cognitive explanation for depression is negative schemas lead to irrational thoughts, well, it makes sense that the cognitive strategy to treat depression is to change these schemas and challenge the irrational thoughts. There are two cognitive therapies, Beck CBT and Alice's REBT. Beck CBT treats the patient as a scientist. This means the patient generates and tests hypotheses about the validity of their rational thoughts. The hope is, when they realise their thoughts don't match reality, this will change their schemas. The irrational thoughts can then be discarded. To go through this process, clients are first taught how to gather data through thought catching. This is identifying irrational thoughts coming from the negative triad of schemas. To do this, they are assigned a homework task of keeping a diary, which is used to record negative thoughts, but also identify situations that could cause negative thinking. As an example, Saul may record when they were invited to a social event. The invitation caused a range of negative thoughts related to the self, others and the future. So, I'm so boring. I don't think I'll have anything interesting to say. People don't tend to like me. I don't think they'll even talk to me. And it's going to be an awkward experience and I'm not going to enjoy it. The patient will be asked to attend this event, and importantly gather evidence by recording what happens. This is hypothesis testing, comparing the negative thoughts to what happens. So maybe they did strike up conversation with a group of people they didn't know and found the event kind of fun. 
To help raise the client's mood, the therapist will also encourage behavioural activation, which is taking part in activities that the sufferer used to enjoy. This might be team sports, travelling or socialising with friends. Ellis's rational emotive behaviour therapy is a development of his ABC model, adding D for dispute and E for effect. These disputes take the form of the therapist confronting the client's irrational beliefs with empirical and logical arguments. Empirical arguments challenge the client to provide evidence for their irrational beliefs, while logical arguments attempt to show that the beliefs don't make sense. In the relationship example, the therapist would suggest that it's not logical to think they're fundamentally unlovable and will never be able to find someone who will stay with them, perhaps pointing to the fact they managed to start a relationship to begin with, so they'll be able to do it again. Empirically, the therapist might point to the evidence of many relationships failing and the individuals in those relationships going on to have new, healthy relationships. The E of the model, the effect then, is hopefully the reduction of irrational thoughts leading to better consequences in the future. REBT also includes what's known as shame attacking exercises. This is getting the client to perform a behaviour they fear doing in front of others. So perhaps someone who thinks they're a bad dancer and hates the idea of dancing in public will be asked to join a dance class. Performing these exercises shows the client they can act against their emotions and cope with an unpleasant experience that they can survive other people's disapproval, and actually, most people don't notice or care about our actions, and ultimately we worry too much about other people's approval. These explanations may have made it seem that Beck's CBT and Alice's REBT are very similar, and while they do have the same end goal, the cognitive restructuring of rational thoughts, how they get there is different. In Beck's therapy, the client is helped to figure out the rationality of their thoughts themselves by acting as a scientist. While for Ellis, the therapist explains the irrationality of the thoughts directly to the patient through disputation. The counter approach to treating depression. Evaluations. March randomly assigned 327 patients to one of three groups. CBT, drug therapy, and the third group was given a combined treatment of CBT and drug therapy. The drug used was an SSRI called fluoxetine. The results after 36 weeks supported the effectiveness of CBT an effectiveness rate that was the same as drug therapy, both at 81%. However, the best results came from the combination treatment with an effectiveness rate of 86%. Potentially explaining the results of the above study is the fact that some people with depression are too severely depressed to engage with CBT. Completing homework, challenging irrational thoughts, and even attending sessions require motivation and commitment. This means drug therapy might be required to stabilize the patient prior to psychological therapy. The role of the patient in CBT is an active one. The client is given the responsibility for the depression, and the therapist provides the tools the client needs to address it. There are different perspectives on this. Supporters of CBT argue this gives the client a sense of personal efficacy, a feeling they're in control of directing their own lives and have the power to make positive changes, better than the passive role of drugs where a client is helpless without biological intervention. On the other side of the argument, critics of CBT argue saying the client is responsible for the depression can be seen as victim blaming. It's suggesting that depression is all in the mind and would go away if the client just fought differently. And this perspective could lead to clients feeling more shame and wider society thinking mental health conditions are less serious than other medical conditions. I'll let you make your own decision on what side of the argument you want to come down on. Another criticism is that both REBT and CBT might be overly focused on the present and how to cognitively structure how the client thinks about their current situation. Some clients do have serious trauma in their past and might want to discuss it with a therapist. Also, reinterpreting present experiences does not necessarily improve the present situation. It may be that the client is in an unhealthy relationship, is experiencing unfulfilling work, discrimination, or has financial problems. Concerns about these social problems are not irrational and may be a factor in the individual's depression. Finally, we can consider an economic argument for CBT. Compared to drug therapy, CBT is significantly more expensive for health services like the NHS to fund. A course of CBT can take 16 to 20 one-to-one -one sessions with a trained therapist. However, many patients prefer CBT to drug treatments due to the lack of side effects and a belief that CBT addresses the root cause of depression. It's not just reducing symptoms. And as CBT is effective in the long term, this means once treated, people can return to work as a productive worker and continue contributing to the economy. So, from a cost-benefit analysis, many feel CBT is worth the expense. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Kat Posnick and Ahmed Romani for supporting at the developer level. 
I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons. So if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos. Of course, including questions on the Psychopathology unit. I hope this was helpful and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.